the epistle. Anybody know what the word epistle means? A letter. A letter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It makes it sound all official. Things like that. So the letter with teaching and stuff in it. Uh, the, the letter of James. And Tom and Stephen had, uh, he, I asked him to lead the study this fall, and he was set ready. He prayed about it, really felt like James would be the way to go. And he was uh, all set to, to lead tonight's session. Uh, I don't think he was all ready or not, but he had, he had the whole time set out. And then with his father passing away, asked if I could come in and cover for him, which I'm very glad to do. And so I'll be covering probably the first couple of weeks. I know he and Henry are planning to you know, take a trip to Germany as well. Hopefully they'll get a chance to do that at some point. Um, but in the meantime, we will uh, eventually get what we'll be studying verse by verse through the book. But tonight is to set up to be, let's let's get to know this book. Let's get to know something about it. And so we'll, we'll give us kind of an overview, and hopefully that will be meaningful for you if, if you haven't already. Some of you may already be super familiar with James. If so, you go ahead and jump in. Uh, we don't want to give away the plot altogether, but there's uh, some, some great stuff here. It's a book that I found super helpful in my own life. I remember as a young Christian, first time I read it, it was like, wow, this stuff is so relevant to my life. There's so much in here. It's super practical. Uh, one of the first Bible studies I led was through James, done it many times, and uh, it can be, um, had my graduate preaching students do their sermons going through James, just because there's so much here that we can take home and we can live today, and I think it's going to be going to be a great step. But let's, uh, let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer, invite the Lord to speak to us before we get started. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you so much for this letter. Thank you for its truth and its relevance for our life. We pray, Lord, you would bless uh, that each of us, as we take this time to study, to jump in, Lord, you would speak to us. And even as we we look at the, the background of it, the history, that's the overview, even tonight, Father, would there be just a, a sweet and special way that you come, you speak to our hearts, you prepare our hearts to be, to be ready to live it out more and more of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Lord, we love you. Praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Great. Thank you, Cindy. Great to see you guys. So. Cindy's here now. It's a party. <laughs> Lockdowns, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we're going to look at, I'm going to invite uh, as many as are willing. I'm not going to force you to do this, but just to help motivate you to pay attention a little bit. Um, we'll ask uh, some of you to read these passages. We want to get to know this guy, James. Get to know a little bit about him. And there are actually several people named James in the Bible. But we can uh, put some things together, both as what we read in Scripture, as well as tradition. And so what we're going to do is kind of go take us down the pathway of what is probably the best explanation of who this James is. So, anybody up for reading Matthew chapter 12, verses 46 to 50? Jessica, next chapter, 13, 54 to 56. Okay, thank you, Chris. John 2, 12. Go on to. Okay, Rob, right? And then John 7, 2 through 5. Okay, thank you, Josh. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8. Okay, all right, thank you, James. All right, we'll get started there, and then... We will go through it. Now, this is a lot of scripture. We're not, notice James isn't even on the book here on the list, but it's going to give us the background on this guy named James. So, I do have here, I don't know if the print is too small. I decided to use a template. That's not always a good thing when creating a PowerPoint slide. So, you're welcome to read this, but if you want to read your own and your translation is different, that's totally fine. But, Jessica, you're going to read verse 46 to 50. While he was still speaking to the Okay, just a second. Who's he? He is Jesus. Jesus, that's right. Okay. Go While on. he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside, asking to speak to him. But he replied to the man who told him, Who is my mother, and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Okay. So, what's significant? Just that passage on the left side. What's significant about that? What do we learn here in this passage that's significant? 
Everybody is Jesus' mother. Yeah, everybody's in relationship with Jesus. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> yeah. What about this literal family? <laughs> yeah, he has brothers. He had brothers. <laughs> and he had sisters. Yes, it yeah, okay. So wait, what is not, not listed here? Say, but another. It's his father. Father. Father is well father in heaven. Yeah. Yeah. Father in heaven, but a literal father is not there. That's significant. Why is it significant that brothers are mentioned in greater world Christianity? about some major streams of Christianity that would struggle with the way that is working. Do you mean like the Catholic Church? Catholic Church. <laughs> <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Are they just <laughs> okay. Why? Why would the Catholics have an issue with that? Because of how they worship Mary and think that she is yeah. too pure to have more kids, I think, or something. Yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, I mean, they call her, her <laughs> eternal virgin. Perpetual virgin. Right. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah, and that is actually a core doctrine of Catholicism. Right. So they had to get really creative of what they're going to do with that word right there and make up the word cousin. Okay? But what's the problem with that? What, why would that not work in that sentence as cousin? Because of the relation. Because of what? It's not the closeness of that close to the relation, because if he said, okay, his mother and his aunts and uncles and cousins, okay, but why would his cousins be hanging out with his mom about their mom? Yeah. What, what, what is the Greek word there? The Greek word there is Adelphos, which means brother, like Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. So Adelphos means brother, but sometimes it can be used for, I can say, Brother Chris and Brother Rob. Anybody been to that church before? And, and Sister Cindy and Sister Darling and Sister Burley. I mean, you know, that's what so we say because we're brothers in Christ. And yeah, but the context here is where that idea started, isn't it? This phrase is why we say, you know, Brother Rodney, how are you doing tonight? And Sister Jessica. You know, that why? Because this is what Jesus said. Yeah. When we're all in relation, if God is our Father, then we're all brothers and sisters. So let's let's help. Okay. All right. So uh, uh, so it's significant that Jesus said brothers. That's important. All right. Now we need to know a little bit more about him in the next chapter. So let's read that next passage. Coming to his hometown, that is Jesus, he began teaching the people in their synagogue. And they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Yeah. And uh, aren't all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? Okay. So what do we learn here? And we didn't learn chapter 12. Yes, he has blood brothers. Brothers and sisters. And we we'll get to know their names. names. Okay, that is significant. Because who's the first one named? James. James. Okay, that's that's going to be really significant for us. Okay, what other names do you see there? Joseph and Judas. Uh -huh. <coughs> now, I underline Judas. Anybody guess why I underline Judas? There's another Judas. No, it's not Judas who betrayed him. Because he's Judas right. Iscariot. It means he came from another town. Right. And he was never called Jesus' brother ever in any other place. But there is a guy through tradition with a name that usually could be Judas, but they don't always put S's on the end of the name, especially Hebrews did not include an S in the end. So there's an interesting guy that we will get to know a little bit later. Actually, I'll show you right now. Jude chapter 1, verse 1. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of oh, James. James. <laughs> so as we go back, we can see that, okay, there's Jude. If we take the Judas, and that's Jude, which was a common interchange. It, it, it's kind of like, uh, uh, what would be like... Nobody calls me Al, but uh, Rob, we call him Rob, but that's not what your birth certificate says, is it? Robert, you're probably Christopher on your birth certificate. So we have these names that we shorten and we put back and forth. 
I was going to name my mother ever called me. Huh? It was Christopher. Yeah. yeah. Whether I was in trouble or not. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we have uh, this Jude, and tradition has handed that down. So why does he call himself a brother of Jesus? And as we'll get to see, James uses that same wording. He doesn't want to claim brotherhood with Jesus. And in fact, uh, as we believe, who is Jesus' father? Joseph. Oh, God. Oh. Yeah, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. So that's part of the significant thing here. Also, we learned in the S sisters, but, but this is significant. Okay. Uh, who has John 2.12? I guess I do. Okay. After he went down to Capernaum, with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. Okay, so this is uh, chapter two. This is after turning the water into wine. And what do we see here? What do we see in Jesus' family? Mother and brothers. Mm -hmm. Who else is missing again for the third time? Sisters. Father. Father. Yeah, no sisters either, but no father. Okay, so we'll keep that. Keep that there along the way. Okay, now this is <clears throat> chapter 7 is a few years later. So chapter 2 is first year of Jesus' ministry. Chapter 7 is early in Jesus' third year of ministry. So it's at least two, two and a half years later. Uh, so who's going to read verses 2 through 5? Okay. Josh, okay. Now the Jews' Jews feast of booths was at hand. So his brother said to him, leave here and go to Judea that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world, for not even his brothers believed in him. Okay, that's hugely significant. Why is, what do we learn? And again, we, we're looking at a lot of scriptures, so we're not answering the question that the scripture writers were answering. But we're looking at, we're doing detective work to see what those scripture writers mention along the way. They're going to help us in our study to try and discover something about James. If this James is indeed one of Jesus' brothers, what do we know about him here in chapter 7? Last year, Jesus ministry. He didn't believe. He didn't believe. That's huge. Let's think about that. Okay? <clears throat> And notice out though, what, what are they doing to Jesus right there? Putting him to the test. Putting him to the test. Okay, how, what do you mean by that? Well, I don't know. You say you're this big uh, prophet, but you're only going around the small villages and like, go to Jerusalem, stand up there, and let's have the, the yeah. elders and the priests examine you and mm -hmm. uh, conf confirm that you are this prophet that you mm -hmm. say that you are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Good. I always thought coaching him. <laughs> Come on, you get more press that way. You know, you get, you know, get on Instagram, Facebook, get social media going. Come on, you look at you know who you are. It's the yeah. kind of brothers you have. Yeah, but, <laughs> but I like your expression, your explanation there, Chris. We don't believe in you, so let's see. It. Let's see if we can make it happen. Okay. So that's significant. So this is September. And about what time of year did Jesus, was he crucified? Well, tradition says Easter, but... <laughs> yeah, no, you know, you know, Easter is, unlike Christmas, which is tied to only God knows what, <laughs> Easter is a holiday that is actually tied to the lunar calendar that drove the Jewish calendar. So we so know... It's Passover. Yeah. yeah, Passover. When, what time of year does Passover take place? Spring. 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 March or April. So this is only six, seven months before Jesus died. Okay? Now let's read 1 Corinthians 15. Let's get this passage first. For I deliver to you as a fasting for me what I also receive. That Christ died for us, for our sins, in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to Caiaphas. Cephas. Cephas. Yeah, it's an Arabic word meaning Peter. It's Peter's name in Arabic. Cephas. Mm -hmm. 
10 to the 12. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Right, thank you, James. This, this is often recognized as a creed uh, that early Christians probably memorized to reinforce their faith. It's written in such a way that makes it easy to learn and easy to remember uh, because it gives the credibility of the resurrection account. Right? In fact, I had a great meeting today with somebody who really struggled with believing whether or not that Jesus could have actually risen from the dead. And one part of the argument is all these people claim to see Jesus. And then later were killed for following Jesus and never renounced him. They were willing to die holding on to the claim that they had seen him after he had risen from the dead. Mm. I mean, that in itself is an incredible mm. testimony. I mean, that, that's, that's, that makes this idea. And so Paul is writing that way. Notice what he says. What are some things about the way this is written that would give substance for an argument that we can know that Jesus has risen from the dead? Numbers. Numbers, mm -hmm. yeah. What number in particular? 500. 500. It's like, you don't believe me. I'll go, we've got 486, still alive. Granted, you know, Grandma Josie's going to die tomorrow and you'll be down 485. But we've got several people that we can we can get together here that you can know for sure because you can talk to them. But what is significant for our study? What is one name in here that's kind of surprising to be included? James. James. I should say when he appears, James. Well, we, we can guess it, though. <clears throat> because when did Jesus stop appearing as such in the way Paul has structured this? No. The whole the last one is when he appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus. Yeah. So, that's so like that was there. Eight. Yeah. So it could have been, yeah. It's a, it's Prior to that, though, it would be the Ascension. Yeah, probably before the Ascension. Probably before Pentecost. So this is that interesting. This James, who seven, eight months earlier did not believe in Jesus. Jesus appeared to him. Well, that made a difference. <laughs> if you'd seen your brother who is, and, and, and I, I think, can we give James a break? How many of you would believe it if your brother or sister came around and said, the Messiah, I'm going to have people like, get a friend. Right, yeah. <laughs> I see it. So, but then, did something happen after seeing him risen from the dead? Did that make a difference? Well, it didn't take too long because our next passage is Acts chapter 1. And we invite a volunteer to read Acts 1, verses 12 through 14. Yeah, okay, Rob. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Ol Olivet, which is near Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Wow. All right, good job with all those names. So this was, Ascension was verse 11. So this is what we're talking about. She said, just risen from the dead. And notice what's significant here. He sure named a lot of people. Yeah, and who are those people who are named? Disciples. Disciples. Who's mm -hmm. missing? James. Judas. Judas is missing. So you got the 11. Mm -hmm. Got married. And you have Jesus' brothers. The same brothers who didn't believe in him eight months earlier. So it did happen. Had that appearance been enough to change who he was? Now we're going to jump ahead to the letter to the Galatians. And I'm doing this because Paul is telling his own story to the Galatians. <coughs> He's dealing with, and you may be familiar with the letter to the Galatians, 
was written to help churches that Paul had started on his first journey. who had been led astray by some of what we would call Judaizers, who said, guys, if you want to be a Christian, you got to get circumcised. And, and it would mean, okay, that's painful and unnecessary, but more than that, it Paul thought being evil because you were going back under the Old Testament Jewish law, which hadn't been enough to save people to begin with, and he saw that Jesus had been setting people free from the law. So the whole letter to the Galatians, most of it, the first three and a half chapters, deal with arguing against this mentality. So Paul is sharing his own story on what he's been through and how it became an issue in the church there in Antioch, what they were dealing with in that area of Judaism. And I'm having us do this because time-wise, it's going to be before the next passage we see James mentioned in Acts. But James is here in a couple of passages. So let's see if we can see what we learn about James and what has happened to him in that time frame here in the previous. Somebody like to read verses 15 through 19 of chapter 1. Okay, thank you, Jessica. But when he knew me, he set me apart before I was born, and who called to me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the <coughs> Lord's brothers. Okay. You may remember who Cephas is? Peter. 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 Okay. All right, and so this is Paul telling his story after he had seen Jesus on the road to Damascus. Uh, notice what 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 Paul is arguing. What what did he not do when he first met Jesus? Not immediately. Didn't consult with anyone. Didn't consult with anyone. So his argument. Why why would he bring that up? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't need to get too sidetracked. So let, let's let's get that question. Actually, I think it's going to be as brilliant. As it's going to be. <laughs> um, but he uh, notice what names he did mention when he finally went to Jerusalem three years later. And I, and just I'll answer my own question. He's doing that because he's saying I got this message from Jesus directly. I'm not teaching anybody else's argument. This is stuff that Jesus showed me. He showed me specifically. And it wasn't until three years that I actually meet anybody who actually walked with Jesus on this planet. And they confirmed what I do. So who's the first person he met? Yes. Peter. And who's the second? James. James. And how is James described? As a brother. As the Lord's brother. Our poor Catholic friends. <laughs> <laughs> So why are you even doing that? We're making an angel there. So, okay. So that's significant. Why? Why is that significant? Why is it significant that he gets mentioned? He must have loved James. I think. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. How How do you think people? In the church, who come to faith in Christ, the thousands of people who believe in Jesus on the day of Pentecost and in the years to follow, how would they have thought about Simon Peter? Well, who preached that sermon that got 3,000 people saved in three days? Peter. Peter. Okay. You think Peter would have had a lot of respect? Mm -hmm. And granted, they might have joked and laughed about all the stories and geeky, stupid things he did. Yeah. <laughs> But he would have been seen as a leader. And immediately after him gets this guy, James, who's Paul, the Lord's brother, is next. Okay? This is the first time we get him in terms of, it's, it's actually written later, but the way Paul writes about him, he's a person of influence. Because then we go over to chapter 2, verse 11. So that we're skipping over a whole bunch of stuff that talks about how all these Judaizers came up to Antioch and were causing a division. Um, so, anybody want to read verse 11 and 13? All right, thank you, Chris. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles, because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. <coughs> okay, you can go ahead and read the next. Oh, 
The other Jews joined him in hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. Okay. All right, so what do we learn about James here? He's sending them out. He's sending them out. Mm -hmm. okay. Does that mean that James had bad doctrine? He wanted them to know about Jesus as their Savior. Yeah. I would take sure it, it the right way. I would take it that James has a significant position. Yes. And that's sure. that's the reason he sends them out. So he sends them out. Uh -huh. What is his position? Yeah, he has of a position authority. Of leadership and authority. Yes. The of people. the church mm -hmm. in Jerusalem. Obviously, some expectation that those men who were going out have been going back to the fold. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And so th this is that issue, what we would call the circumcision party, or if you're going to be Christian, you're going to be fully Jewish. And remember, the Jewish law was really strong about you're not going to socialize with the Gentiles, you don't go into their homes. So Peter had been hanging out with everybody in Antioch. Yeah, hey, I'm one of you. And this guy showed up. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't come to your party tonight. <laughs> and so there's a little bit of that going on. And that is going to set up some stuff we'll see later in chapter 15 of the book of Acts. But before we get to 15, let's go to chapter 12, verses 16 and 17. Somebody like to read these? Okay, Josh, Ryan, why don't you go? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, but Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. Mm -hmm. But mentioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to his brothers. Then the departed, then he departed and went to the another place. So this is when the angel had set him free from prison. Mm -hmm. Peter set him free from prison. And then he came, the first thing he said, he found the disciples gathered together in prayer. Who did he want to know that he had been released? James. James. Once again, James sounds like he's in a position of leadership, right? James and to the brothers. There's one person you're going to name is going to be that person who's in leadership. Okay. Uh, now I want to jump ahead. Uh, this is 1 Corinthians 9. And it's just an interesting yeah. side statement. You're significant in there. It's to the brothers, not to his brothers. So he's now yeah. talking to about the brothers. brothers. Yeah. 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 Good point. Yeah. It's a good, good, good insight there. Okay. Do we not? So this is. Paul is arguing for his rights as an apostle, what he should be able to do. He doesn't have a wife, but his argument is, do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? What can we tell about James? He's married. He was married. It was huh. Mrs. Yes. James. <laughs> and so was Peter. And so was Peter. But Peter's wife uh, ministered to Jesus' her name's ministry in Acts, in Mark chapter 2. His mother in law, I guess. So. His mother in law. <laughs> yeah, that's the story. Okay, so Acts 15 is a story of when uh, there was that big split, big argument that we saw talked about in Galatians. Do the Gentiles need to be circumcised to be saved? And they had such a big debate. That's when the church in Antioch decided to send Paul and Barnabas down to Jerusalem, and they gathered all the disciples who were there. Peter's the only one we see speaking up, but apparently all the others were there too. And the Pharisees who had become Christians. And they all got together and they had a big discussion. Everybody presented their argument. We don't see any details about the, the Judaizer side, but we do see that they had a chance to share their story. Paul and Barnabas talked about all the Gentiles getting saved. Peter recounted his story of seeing Cornelius and his friends, the Roman centurions, saved in Acts 20. They had never had a chance to even be circumcised. And then it says in verse 13, after they finished, James replied. And he started to go through and he talks about everything that's happened. And then he's still talking, verse 19, Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. What is that word, my judgment, say? My decisions. Authority to make a decision. A whole group of people, huge range of opinions. But James is the one who makes the final decision. 
course, uh, um, he's also seen as the person who should make that decision. Yeah, mm -hmm. respected by everybody. Mm -hmm. But the way they were in the letter, anybody remember how the letter got worded that they sent out to everybody? It seemed good to us and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So what I love about that letter is they were able to know James once said it's my decision. By the end, they could all agree and they all recognized God had been a part of that. And yet James was the guy in charge. So that, that's significant right there. So we have gone through, we don't know exactly the years of everything, but Jesus rose from the dead probably about 30 AD, 30. Uh, this Acts 15 incident is probably about 47 AD, so 17 years later. Just kind of think about that. Paul saved on the road to Damascus, 33, 34 AD, somewhere in that time frame. His first journey, probably 46, uh, 40, somewhere in that, in that year time span. So just kind of keep that in mind. Now we're going to jump ahead from, again, 47, 48 A.D. to the year 59 A.D. So this is 12 years later. Paul has taken two more journeys and established a whole lot more churches and a lot more things have taken place. He spent three years in Ephesus, a year and a half in Corinth, and traveled around. And he's come back to Jerusalem with a big offering, bringing people from all these churches that he founded to just keep them honest. And he's showing up, and the offering is for the Jewish Christians who are struggling in poverty and persecution and things like that. And so, Acts chapter 20, verse 18. Somebody want to read this one? Sure, from here. Okay, right. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all elders were present. Okay. So, who? What, what's it going to get here? Paul went in with? James. To James, but with us, us, which means who was there? You got to know something about the book of Acts. The author of the book of Acts was with Paul. That's Luke. So that's an interesting thing. Oh, so he was there right. an eyewitness. And once again, only one person is named who was their audience, and it is James. And if we would go on, we will take time to read the rest of that chapter. You see, James is the one who gives Paul instruction, James speaks with authority. So, James was obviously, what What can we tell about James just from these passages we've read so far? Everything we can tell. About. He's a leader. Yeah. He's a leader. But yes. this one here is probably in hiding because they wait to him. Mm -hmm. Although, if he is a leader, you'd also yeah. not, not respect him. Not total hiding because he told Paul to go make an offering in the temple. And that's what got Paul in trouble. So, he wasn't hiding himself. Well, he was accepted as an authority. Mm -hmm. Already, yes. Yeah, by all the Christians, and even Paul, they just recognize him as the Lord. He was close to Jesus when Jesus was alive. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Brothers, although what was his attitude towards Jesus when he was alive? Huh? Did he believe him? He did believe him, yeah. At least he was around. But at least he was there, near a conversation. He must have been. He was so a witness. He was teaching because he was around yeah, and he knew his uh, so he went through some kind of an attitude change towards Jesus, big time. Probably yeah. Jesus appearing to him there along the way. Okay. All right, now let's go beyond what the Bible says. What we can see from a first century historian, a guy named Josephus. Anybody uh, familiar with Josephus? Okay, Rob, can you tell us about Josephus? Well, uh, he was a general, mm -hmm. which I was surprised to find out yeah. when I learned it. A Roman general. No, he was a Roman general. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, he was fighting the Romans. Yeah, and he uh, very smart man, uh, just gifted. Uh, made wonderful observations, mm -hmm. and so generally speaking, people believe what he wrote mm -hmm. was a fact. And he was. Uh, he actually was part of the rebellion against the Roman Empire. He won some battles for them up front, but then got taken prisoner by the Romans. Right. And then he ended up swapping over to help the Romans to, when they destroyed the Jerusalem. He wasn't fighting for them, but he did provide some intel. Um, but he uh, was very influential, and he wrote two books to, that are very, very significant in history. 
This one called Jewish Antiquities. He probably finished about 94 AD. He probably spent 15 years writing it. Tells us it overlaps a lot with the Old Testament, but fills in a lot of missing details of the history of the Jewish nation at, through the end of uh, the Old Testament until the coming of the New Testament, until his own time period. Another one is called the Jewish War. It tells the story of the big war that took place with the Romans that led to the destruction of the temple in the year 67. Right? It actually started 64 to 70 AD. So it's like stories like Masada, things like that. And, and it's fascinating. He's a great writer. Both of those are really good books to read. You ever mm -hmm. get. But this part here is from Jewish Antiquities, and it's very significant. I don't know if that font's too small to read, or can somebody want to read that? And I who we have told you already, the high priesthood, and was a bold man in his temper, and very insolent. He was also of the sect of the Sadducees, who were very rigid in judging offenders, both the rest of the Jews. As we have already, ob already observed, when therefore Ananias was of this disposition, he thought he had now a proper opportunity to exercise his authority. Festus was now dead, and Albinus was now was but upon the road. Which kind of road? Is he on the road to death or is he uh, on the yeah, physical probably. road? Yeah, on the road to death. I think that's so he assembled the Sanhedrin of Judges and brought before him the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James, and some others, or some of his companions. And when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he had delivered them to be stoned. Now, why is this significant? What is Josephus not as far as we know? He is not a believer. That's it. Mm -hmm. Not a Christian believer. Not a Christian believer. Although he does speak very well of Jesus. So that's sometimes some people wonder. Maybe he did become a Christian before his death. But, but, but at the time, he's not writing as a Christian. He's a Sadducee. He was a Sadducee. Mm -hmm. So what do you see? Why is this significant? What is he saying? He is confirming James as the brother of Jesus. Yes. Sorry, Catholic friends. <laughs> yeah. And it also we can date James' death. Because we know exactly all the names of these people. This had to be the year 62 AD. Which is very significant because the 60s, just like the 1960s, were a chaotic year in America. The 60s were a horrible year for the Jewish people because that was their year with the, 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 the decade that they had the war with the Romans. It was also uh, the decade that Peter and Paul were both executed as probably most of the apostles of Jesus. John may have been the only one who survived the 60s. And, and so it's interesting that in 62, it would have been probably about the time Paul was released from his first imprisonment that James was executed. Okay. Anybody know? Okay, here's a trivia question for you. Anybody know what an ossuary is? It is a usually stone container mm -hmm. in which the partially cremated remains of... Um, the deceased to work place after they were burned. Mm -hmm. Everything's right except they weren't burned. It was after the flesh had decayed, the bones would be placed in. So it was long enough to hold <laughs> the Jewish Osiri with that kind yeah, of Yeah, maybe maybe an Osiri in other places. There, 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 there are also other cultures in the UK that are uh, from partial cremation. Okay. Because open flame mm -hmm. fires do not fully cremate to Okay, okay. interesting. I'm impressed, Chris. Too many British historical programs. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, it was interesting. If you ever go to any ancient museums like in, yeah. in Israel, you will see lots of ossuaries. They are shorter than caskets. We like our caskets in America wide. So you put the whole body there, and you let the skin decay while it's laying underground. The way the Jews did it was they didn't, you know, ground was more rare and scarce, or they just decided by the first century what they would do would be to place the body in the in the tomb and let the, the skin and muscles decay for a year. 
And then as a ceremony on the one year anniversary of the passing of your loved one, you'd open, roll away the stone, go in there, all that would be left would be the bones. You'd collect them together and place them in an ossuary like this and then put them in there and there would be something that would be uh, engraved in there. Like the high priest. Mm -hmm. They found his yeah, ossuary. Yeah, so this <coughs> one was discovered in 2003. And it lists in, in scratched in uh, Hebrew, similar to the times. It's Siachakol, uh, the son of Joseph, that was written right there, and James, the son of Joseph. And so it made made the headlines. It was a very big deal because could this be James? I mean, was it dated? It was the style. It was the work. Um, and the individual who found it, though, was accused of forgery, was actually uh, charged with the crime and tried, but then acquitted. <coughs> so, <laughs> so it's still an unanswered question. A lot of experts are not necessarily going, yes, yes, we know this is it. There's like a, hmm, a lot of stuff that people may say. Yeah. And that's the thing, those are pretty common names. So, you know, is it historic? Is it actually James? We don't know. But still a pretty cool idea of thinking how it could be. So, other people that we uh, hear who talk about James, and is this James uh, the right one that, as we think it? Um, and his letter, is his letter, did he actually write the letter that we have? That's another good question. And so I've got several names here. I'll give you kind of some background. I'm sorry the font's so small. Uh, first one, First Clement is a letter written by Clement, who was the bishop of the church in Rome. So he's a guy with significant influence, who is uh, writing to a church we believe is in Philippi, not 100% sure. What's interesting is that there was a Clement mentioned in Philippians, so they, well, maybe it could be the same guy, maybe, we don't know, they got moved to Rome. Um, so he's influential. This is one of the earliest documents of which we have good historical reliability it was written by who claimed to be by a Christian writing within the same century that uh, Jesus himself was alive so this is a very significant historic document it's also significant because it quotes a lot of New Testament letters and other um, Gospels it does quote verbatim but does not cite which Laura what does that mean yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't, he plays, he's not giving credit to the author, but he quotes James several times. So, so he, there are several passages that are there. So that's significant. What that would tell us is, James is probably already in circulation. Already an influential letter at that point in time, so that had written in 496. Same thing happened with 2 Clement. Uh, I'd love to say it's the same guy, but probably not, probably, but... <laughs> Uh, he doesn't ever name himself, and it's actually more of a sermon than a letter, but it's still influential, and it still quotes James several times along the way. Now, the next name, Tertullian, he wrote a ton of stuff, right, about 280. Super influential Christian. He lived in North Africa, um, and a very significant leader in the early church, faced a lot of persecution. So, very significant, what we call patristic, early church father. Um, he believed that what, what I've been hinting at all along, James was the half-brother of Jesus and the child of Mary and Joseph, born after Jesus. Okay? So, Tertullian is, gives that argument. The next thing there, Proto Evangelium of James, is a letter claimed to have been written by James, uh, but it is, uh, had been recognized what we call spurious, um, or uh, Pseudepigrapha, I mean, lying writings, and, and it's not all bad, but there was a lot of that going on in the 100s and 200s. People would pretend to be one of the apostles, like the Gospel of Thomas. Anybody ever read or watch the Da Vinci Code movie that came out 20 years yeah. ago? Okay, that's based on one of those uh, apocryphal works that's not much to it, Gospel of Thomas. You just read the Gospel of Thomas some time ago, yeah, this can't be real. <laughs> it's, it's not the right, it's just you know, mm -hmm. the whole thing. Concept of Da Vinci Code. Um, so, 
the Proto-Evangelion of James is one of those letters, but what's interesting, it introduces the idea that Joseph had been married before he and Mary got together. And his wife had passed away. And James and Jude and the others on that list that we read in Matthew 13 were his sons from a previous marriage. Huh? Is the get out of jail free card that the Nicholas use? Yeah, but they don't take that one. They don't like that one. <laughs> yeah. They don't like that one. Yeah. That, which would seem like it. The Orthodox will take it. They'll yeah. run with that. But yeah, you would think it. You would think it would work that way. Now, with everything we read, the New Testament is that a possibility? It's not an impossibility, mm -hmm. given yes. that Joseph is considered to be an elder person of prominence who's mm -hmm. taking a younger bride from Mary. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Except for the scripture that says he knew her not until after Jesus was born, because then she would no longer give birth. And... That's a good one. I don't know. If That's a good one there. Not, that that not doesn't. Good. That doesn't necessarily disqualify James and those guys being from an earlier marriage, but that until is a huge word that really lends credit to the argument of Tertullian that, yep, those guys were kids of Mary and Joseph. But the argument that Joseph is not recorded in adult Jesus ministry days, it's always Mary and his brothers, could be a possibility. And honestly, we, we can't say for sure that would make it that James and everybody else have to be significantly older than Jesus. And James is the oldest. There had to be at least a six-year gap between uh, James and Jesus. It probably could have been 10 or 15 years. We don't know. But uh, most, of, most of us Protestants tend to go with the Tertullian argument. But Jerome, um, and any, anybody have a friend named Jeremy? Yes. Yeah, Jessica. I'm just curious, so why would they have to be because there were so many brothers. Place. Because there was that many brothers mentioned. Was James the oldest? Yeah. Okay. He was mentioned first. Gotcha. Yeah. That's good. Mm -hmm. So uh, Jerome is the one who first translated the Bible into Latin. Mm -hmm. It's called the Vulgate. Even to this day, it's the most popular Latin Bible available. And you go there. He was a credible scholar follower of Jesus, but he was a big time Catholic. So, so many things in core Catholic doctrine mm -hmm. really go back to Jerome, including the perpetual virginity of Mary. And so, they don't like her until we're, they would say, no, nope, they would, they would. not, not, never, not, never. Was really there. You're, you're imagining it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, until, no, never, 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 didn't happen, didn't happen. She had to be a perpetual virgin. And not only that, and I, uh, like, I always thought the Immaculate Conception was talking about Jesus' conception. Guess what? Guess what the Immaculate Conception What's is? her? It's Mary's. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, even Mary was born without weird. sin. So it's like, that, that makes it even weirder. Say that. <laughs> Where do you get that? Over here. So, the other thing that's significant, Origen, who was uh, another early Christian scholar, lived in the city of Alexandria, Egypt. He is the first person to actually name James, the brother of Jesus, as the author of the letter of James. That doesn't mean that others didn't know or didn't understand it that way. By the time Eusebius wrote the first big church history, we still have. He gave credit to it. Everybody had recognized it there. So it may have been that we simply don't have any other record of that. But as far as we can tell, we put all that together. Some things we know for sure. A guy named James wrote the letter of James in all likelihood because it just makes sense. Because that James that we've been looking at, he was a leader of the early church. He was influential. And James, as we're going to see when he writes a letter, writes with authority. You should listen to me. You should hear what I have to say. He's somebody to be heard and be listened to and take care of. So all those things are going to be uh, significant there. And um, is, in, was James, is it possible that, that James was born to somebody else besides Mary and Joseph earlier marriage? Possible. Um, probably slightly more likely the parent of, or his, his mother was Mary, but we don't know for sure on that. Can't say for sure. Okay. 
So that's our author. Now let's look at the recipients. This is the first one. Now we're actually in the Yeah, sure. To right. go back to that. Mm -hmm. It said, they say, it's, are not these Jesus' brothers? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, did they refer to stepbrothers as brothers? Mm -hmm. and yeah, but would I, the people have accepted that Jesus was born of a virgin? <coughs> as Thomas people. No, I'm just saying. Most often, though, when you're referring to a family, you don't call out all stepbrothers. Yeah. Brother, the real brother you, and the stepbrother. You, yeah. you just say brothers yeah. uh, and sisters. So, you know, uh, you know, these aren't parts of a genealogy, mm -hmm. genealogy okay. elsewhere. Right. So, you know, I can accept it either way, um, but it doesn't affect my faith. Oh, absolutely not. You know, it's like if bro if he had a half brother, it's like, well, you know. So what? You know, I can I can take communion with a Catholic. Well, Catholic would take communion with me because they would let me take communion. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's for different reasons. That's for different reasons. Unless, unless they didn't know you were Catholic. <laughs> but I would respect their um, uh -huh. position, so I wouldn't. But um, I do. So um, <laughs> it doesn't stop me being a fellow Christian, a fellow brother to a um, mm -hmm. Catholic because they have some different idea about who Jesus' brothers were. Yeah. No, it's not. I, and, you know, if James was a half-brother, he was still held respect by the church then. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. because we've seen it in all these letters and everything else and all the, these um, um, non-biblical uh, writers. So it matters not to me what James was in terms of his bloodline relationship to Jesus or Mary, <laughs> um, but it does. By the way, the only reason I brought that up wasn't to take it this far. Because my finish. The Catholic Church had a habit of taking things, mm -hmm. and many of them were very. Mm -hmm. and, and making it part of their whole faith that still exists today. Yeah. And so we, we, we talk about, you know, this, this, and, you know, the apparition of Mary. I know who's doing that. You go to France, it's not Christ that's doing it, the enemy that's doing it. All the credit goes to Mary. I don't care what they say out of it, it is Mary that's getting all the mm -hmm. benefit of the healing that occurred. And so that's I just... I'm just saying that, that uh, uh, they're not alone. I mean, you got Orthodox take some of the, the same kind of things. They're very tiny, but it becomes so part of their faith. Yeah. I mean, look how long look to get rid of uh, 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 when they died. Catholics always went to Kurt, Kurt, thank you. Yeah. And that was just finally saying, no, there's no such thing as, uh -huh. well, the, you know, where'd they get that from? You know, Cardinal Kent de la Mesa, the alpha guy, I got to know him a little bit. And uh, you should read some of his books. He questions all kinds of Catholic doctrine. Uh, and yet he that's is... That's what Martin Luther did. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's right, exactly. <laughs> and even now, in his own yeah. books, as a Catholic and as a cardinal, uh, he's the cardinal um, father. Mm -hmm. uh, father to all the free... Uh, the, 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 uh, so, I mean... They Absolutely. argue amongst themselves a lot. <laughs> yeah, I think I think we, we would not divide over this in terms of right. saying we're not in fellowship, but right. it is a concern with some of the barriers that get put in the way of coming to your faith in Jesus, for sure. Mm -hmm. But let's, uh, let's take a look at the first verse of James to see who this letter was written to. When you were reading somebody else's mail, it's usually a good idea to <laughs> try to understand uh, who, who the audience is. We're going to be interpreting it accurately. So I'm going to read verse 1. I know Josh, you've been having your hand up there. I haven't got to read it again. So. Oh. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion. Okay. So we do get to see, again, James, you the same wording that Jude does, so he helps out for other Jude. But who, is the, who are the recipients? Twelve tribes. Twelve tribes. What does that mean? Jewish tribes. Yeah. Jewish tribes. Okay. 
But they're dispersed, so then they're they're dispersed. Uh -huh. The diaspora. I remember as a kid, my church had a pipe organ and had all these different settings, and you could put it on the tabs and you push down. One was called diaspora. I don't know what that means. But and I go, oh, it means dispersed. Mm -hmm. So, um, what do we know then about our readers? That are Jewish. Jewish ancestry. Jewish ancestry. That is spread out. And they're spread out. Okay. Now, the word diaspora by the first century was used to talk about, we were talking about it earlier, before, around the table, right, Rob? Right. Jews, by um, all of their times being taken captive, taken into all the places that they were led into exile, ended up spreading all over the world. You know, if you go to India, uh, end up in Chennai, you find where the apostle died. And he just followed the trade routes mm -hmm. of the Jews all the way to southern and east, west. Oh, Thomas. Yeah, 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 Thomas. You can go all the way. I mean, the guy, he just kept going and kept going and finally was martyred in the Chennai. And so there were Jews everywhere. But yeah. it, what's interesting is, does that mean these Jews were still Jews and not Christians? Or Jews. They're Jews by ancestry, but... Yeah. You know, Jesus is their Savior. Yeah. Well, no, What's interesting is that, uh, and I'll, it'll show up in a later slide, Jesus is only mentioned twice in this letter. The word Christ is only mentioned mm -hmm. at each of those occurrences. And, and this letter is not evangelistic. It's not like Romans or even Galatians. It, it doesn't share the gospel or Ephesians. It, it, there's no explanation of the gospel. And yet it is definitely not a, not a letter for non-Christians. It assumes the readers are Christians. But James writes in a way, in this introduction, he assumes all of his readers are Jewish. Which is kind of significant. Mm -hmm. So does that mean it predates that Jerusalem convenience? We don't see any, I mean, it could. Some scholars say yes. Some scholars say yes. Most say no. We can't say for sure. But some say in the mid-40s, so that would have been before. Others say the 50s. Some say even 61, even right up to the time he was killed. But we don't, we don't know for sure. Okay, so let's... Now that we know who wrote it, what we can tell about the recipients, let me just give you kind of an overview where we're headed. Not the structure of the letter, but what is it that makes this, this book of the Bible different uh, from other books? And why is that significant? And the first thing is, it's a very specifically Jewish yet Christian author and audience. Whereas Paul, when he wrote most of his letters, had assumed the readers were a mix or mostly Gentile. Um, and Peter and, and Jude imply that they're probably mostly G Jewish background, but we don't know for sure, not first Peter for sure. So we really can't tell that, whereas James makes that assumption. James uses a lot of wording and imagery that's going to be really familiar, and quotes a lot of Old Testament, cites a lot of stories. So it's something that he assumes his people are of a Jewish background. Another thing that makes it a really fun letter to do in a study like this is so relevant, it's so practical, so much stuff for the way we live life even today. It's just a great letter, and often, uh, whenever I'm leading somebody to faith in Christ, first thing I want to read is the Gospel of John. It's simple wording, and it's about Jesus. You've got to know Jesus. And the second thing, read James. This is what it means to live like you're following Jesus. Another thing, James is really, really good at, at doing some really fun metaphors. Uh, anybody remember what a metaphor is? It's a word image. It's what? It's like a word picture. Word picture. Word, word picture. And he brings in lots of pictures. So let me just give you some of these. Wind-tossed waves. Withering plants. A mirror. A dead body. A bridled horse. The turning of a ship. A forest fire. Taming wild beasts, a fountain that gives out both fresh and bitter water, being impossible. 
a vine that gives you both grapes and figs being impossible, a mist, clothes eaten up by moths, rust that acts like fire, farmers waiting for the rain, rain watering the earth. Another thing is he loves extremes. He loves to exaggerate in opposition to show contrast. We should consider our trials as pure joy. How many of you are likely to do that when you're going through a rough time? Okay? <laughs> the humble brother ought to take pride in his high position. The rich man should take pride in his low position. God is not tempted by evil. No. Okay. Full-grown sin gives birth to death. And again, another imagery right there. God the Father gives birth to believers. Demons believe and shudder. The tongue is a fire, a world of evil set on fire by hell. Your desires battle within you. So you've got this just one right there. Um, one thing some people see in opposition between Paul and James. Although Paul, other than a little hint that we saw in Galatians 2, he doesn't speak badly in James. And he even goes, he's the first guy he saw him every went to Jerusalem. So there's a mutual respect. Um, I think it's just understanding that their ministry is different. When we get to chapter 2, uh, it may be Tom leading by then, but we'll see. That is the passage that people say, doesn't that disagree with Romans? And I think we'll, we will take a look and come out the other side, I believe, with good confidence. Nope. I think they're answering two different questions. Um, I mentioned earlier, Jesus is only named twice, and Christ is at the same time as Jesus Christ, whereas God is named 13 different. Um, this The letter's teaching is very similar to Jesus' teaching in the Synoptic Gospels, especially the Sermon on the Mount. So it very much indicates just a similarity. Yeah, my brothers, okay, you can see that, half brothers. Um, and there are lots of commands that are given, lots of super practical, super instruction. But James doesn't say, do this. He gives them a reason why, he gives them a story, he gives an example. A lot of times those examples become Anybody else familiar with James or anything you just love about James that you would add to that list that you would say it's really cool? What think about the letter? I think kids were saying that he's pretty rude. He's rude? Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In your face. He's going to call it, yeah. Okay. Is that good? You cover it. Uh -huh. Yeah. It's short and succinct. And he gets to the point. It's the point. It's also not highly structured. We kind of throw some ideas out and kind of flow from one idea to the next. Which, words. Paul's like super argumentative. Which would contrast the two authors. Um, Paul mm -hmm. is a Pharisee. Mm -hmm. He's an educated. He is clearly in some of the Gospels writing with his own hands. Mm -hmm. Some of his letters he's writing with his own hands. Whereas James, if he's a, a son of Joseph, he's the son of a carpenter. Mm -hmm. Which is more, he's not quite a fisherman, but he's mm -hmm. still one yeah. of the lowly right. uh, um, careers. Um, although some people do equate carpenter with masonry, so, but that's a different aside. Yeah, it is a great <laughs> yeah, sure. um, So it would fit that it would be yeah. less structured, mm -hmm. less well thought through. Less, less of the Greek analytical approach, more of the Hebrew floating mm -hmm. pictures. Stories. Although uh, it's interesting, the, the grammar itself is very good. But you probably use a scribe. Yeah, you may have. You may have. You may have learned more about the ways he went. You know what I, I know struck me is that he potentially was the better speaker, whereas Paul was thought to not necessarily always be the best speaker, but he wrote very mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times people that not engage in writing, you know, really we're leading verbally and mm -hmm. through, you know, visibility versus mm -hmm. on paper. So it, it mm -hmm. you know, kind of lends itself <clears throat> to that, I think. Yeah. Some of the major themes that we will touch on, and, and there, are, there are many, so uh, this list doesn't cover all of them, but just a few of the big ones. Perseverance, you can see early on. Wisdom, which really taps into Proverbs and stuff like that. It comes in Ecclesiastes. There's a lot of stuff about wisdom. Right? 
uh, true religion in the sense that gets demonstrated by caring for people in need and walking in humility, sincerity, doing things from right motives. Uh, no motives are questioned over and over again. And James visits prayer over again several different times. So the key texts on prayer are found here. So uh, we, will, we will see those as we go. Right. Well, anybody have any questions or comments before we transition to so in the disciples list, uh, it says James, and then also in the end they said his brothers. So it's the same James mentioned both times? Or? In, in, and in which in the disciples list? No, uh -uh. it's clearly it, not. In fact, I uh, wonder if I can guess which slide that was. Let me try out here. I think it's Matthew. Uh, it? No. Okay, this one right here. This is significant. So how many James do you see on that passage? That Three. And which one is missing? James. Our James. It's not even on there. Because where is where our James occur? His brothers. His brothers, right? So you've got three of them. Peter, John, and James. So this James is important. Why? Where is he on the list? Third. Third. And who are, who are ahead of him? Peter and John. Who are the most cited. Peter more cited than the other. John is the second most, and John also did what? He wrote a gospel, yeah, and three letters, and probably Revelation. So, so he's these two are super influential. So, him coming in third would indicate third in influence. Um, we also know who's who's his brother. <laughs> who's who's that James brother? And then just perform on the list. John. John. And they wanted to argue about who's on. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> so I might be something on the right and the left. When Jesus called them, anybody remember their nickname? Sons, Sons of Thunder. Sons of Thunder or Water Jays, right? But what happened to this James? We do know what happened to this James. Acts chapter 11. He was killed. He was, he was executed, he was martyred. One of the first martyrs. Actually, the first martyr of the 12 apostles. So. That's that James. Then we have this other guy named James, son of Alphaeus. And people are like, uh, <laughs> son of James. <laughs> you know, who is Alphaeus? Could that be the same James? And eh, probably not. It's, you wouldn't have put it twice in the You know, there's, there's that there. So this, the other James is the one that we really tend to focus on more. And then there's some other James in the region. Presumably that Judas is the same, the grandson of Alphaeus. Oh, no, not necessarily. Because you know the dreams. Okay, well, how can we pray for you? Certainly, we're going to be praying for Tom right now in this uh, season. And uh, if anybody remembers, Tanya Pierce spoke with her yesterday. See how her surgery went. She had gone in. We had to get to the hospital at 5 in the morning. Went through all that. Her blood pressure was too high for the surgery. So it's rescheduled for next Monday. Okay. So, please pray for her. Okay, anybody else can be for her? Yeah. Pray for my job. For a job? Okay. Pray that she can get a job. Speaking of jobs, a lot of you, I've shared with several of you here, and I have. We haven't done it from the pulpit because we don't want to embarrass him, but our son, Stephen, has been without a job for years and uh, really struggling and dealing with a lot of depression. And, uh, of course, we've been praying for him, and a lot of you have as well. And he just got bound into Germany, he started applying, and he picked up a job doing door-to-door -door sales. That's like the last thing in the world. Ever imagine my son doing it. I mean, he's a major introvert. I mean, I'm lying. He, he, he did the best of his class and got promoted after two weeks, three weeks. So um, he's, he's thriving as much as he can be. I still don't think it's his favorite career, per se, but, but we haven't seen him do this well for years. So he still needs Jesus. So but we're grateful to see him making progress and making friends, wanting to be out. So instead of being locked up in a spare room all the time, we hardly see him in the house anymore. So. Okay. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. That's a huge step. Yes. Huge. That's good. Nice yeah. to hear that some of our prayers are answered. Yeah, yes. it is. That's why I don't always get that chance to say. So, James. 
Yeah, let's pray for my first one daughter. She's preparing for her national exams. Mm. I'm back in Kenya, I'm not too far high school. Okay, right. National exam. Okay, what's your name? Corinne. Corinne? C O R I N E. Corinne. 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 Thank you for, for your brother James, who's taught us.